All right. Oh, look at my hair. Um, so who is joining us for discussion? Uh, everyone's welcome to turn on their camera and their video and their microphone or just their micro. Well, don't turn on your microphones, actually. <laughs> until it's time to talk, but please turn on your videos if you're gonna join us for, uh, for discussion. I have, uh, oh, that was, this is the first time, all right, bye Charles. Um, this is the first time that uh, we'd seen this also, so. Uh, it's fresh, <laughs> but I did prepare some questions for us. Um, I'm gonna try and pull those up on my screen. Um, but while I'm looking for those, does anyone wanna offer a short sort of first thought about the movie? I liked it. Liked it. Anyone else like it? Well, I'm used to a lot of the, the travel films where they kind of say, okay, we're coming into uh, Louisiana Parish now. And I met Bob and Gwen. They didn't want to give me their last name, but they've been living here on this, uh, uh, as they call it, a, a neighborhood for seven years. And they're really happy because of all the freedom and the tolerance and then go in and give us these snippets that they forced the viewer to kind of assume these little conversations were taking place and they were going to stay there like for three months or a week and the viewer kind of figured all that out so yeah. i i was trying to figure out the connective tissue as the conversation went on yeah same here um i liked that it was different though in that way um, so I actually, since I hadn't seen the film, oh, Lynn, do you have a comment? I see you're unmuted. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I enjoyed watching it. I enjoyed peeking into the various places they took us. I think that's what I like most about it. Um, and it felt very, pleasant. yeah, it stands to, it stands to reason that a lot of the uh, places they found were a very interesting, you know, they even said it was kind of like a lot of misfits from society, but it was really cool. I really enjoyed meeting all those people, misfits, um, <laughs> and um, seeing how they're living and what they're doing, you know, not being all connected into the broader society like we are. It was great. Yeah. I don't, know if, I don't know if it was pur pur purposeful, but um, starting out with mm -hmm. roadkill seemed like, let's make sure that everybody knows this is going to be, could be kind of <laughs> way out there. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I, like they put the most shocking thing for, at least the most shocking thing for me first. Just mm -hmm. sort of get me thinking differently. Um, so what, as I was saying, having not, um, having not seen the film before, I went on these guys' Facebook page about the movie, mm -hmm. and I just, um, I wrote down some quotes from them that seemed like they sort of encompassed some of the themes from the movie, and so I thought I'd read a quote, and then we can all talk about it. So the first one is, yeah, the first one is, comfort is relative. The body and mind are surprisingly adaptive, and it seems that no matter what material luxuries we surround ourselves with, we'll find reasons to be unsatisfied. Mm -hmm. Riding through the Appalachian Mountains in the winter and sleeping outside reset our standards in a way. After we got over that initial hump, we were shocked with what we could find comfort in. Uh -huh. this, it mm -hmm. feels like that's a little bit about sort of sustainability and self-sufficiency like you don't need as much as people often think they do 
right like to live, live and be happy that's Go true ahead. but but what about responsibility i mean everybody couldn't live like that or we have not i mean it'd be chaos i mean i i'm all for you know living low and um and living high, really. I mean, I have a very satisfying life. Well, before COVID, I did, but <laughs> but I'm I live very. I my one of my goals is to keep things out of the landfill. Put as little as I can into the landfill. Uh -huh. And growing, I have a pea patch, all sorts of things. But I mean, but there's certain responsibilities we have if we're in a community that you can't just live off you know, live off everybody else. I mean, yeah, yeah. there was a certain amount of lawlessness in this film. Yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, it was interesting to see it, but I'm thinking, well, it's just for a certain few, but I mean, this isn't, this isn't a way of life for, well, you have to be wanting to be free of all things. But anyway, I mean, it's all very well, but <laughs> yeah, I'm nearly 80 and I, I mean, I've, I lived on, I was brought up in rural Australia and I, I didn't know how I ended up in Seattle because I married a Boeing engineer who was from Egypt. But I mean, it's, <laughs> I had no plans to come here or anything. And Seattle is lovely when it's lovely, but it's when it's like, you know, gray and cold and miserable, I think, what am I doing here? Yeah. Ooh. But anyway, when it was sunny today and that makes everything great. So, <laughs> but, um, but so it's it's good to a point, but well, it's good to see that they two years they they were on the road, hey, eh, with their bikes and yeah. just um, went perambulating. So I missed the beginning because I got home late. I'm with access at the moment. I haven't driven over a year, and um, and so they they got me home really late, and so I should have been here for the beginning. But anyway, so. Um, I'm just thinking, I'm going to look, is it on YouTube? Is the film available, do you think, on YouTube or? It's on Amazon Prime. Well, I don't belong to any of those things. Yeah, I, I think that's I, the I watch only Canopy place. from the library and I watch YouTube, wonderful stuff on those. I don't, I can't even keep up with all yeah. the stuff there is available. There and may be, some, there may be clips of it on YouTube, but I, don't, I doubt the whole movie is there. All right. Well, that's that's the way I've done it too. Just looking yeah. at clips, right? Sort of put it all together and see the highlights. All right. I might try that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the word recycle gets me because that's that's a big thing for me. But then I'm sad to hear that most of what's recycled just gets dumped anyway. They don't have any way to recycle it anymore to reuse it. I know they said that in Australia when I was there last. I usually go every four years for six months. And I i mean, I was shocked when people would toss things out and I'd say, that should go in the recycling. Oh, they just throw all that in the dump anyway. I said, oh, come on. And then I found out it was true. And then I get back to Seattle and I find out it's happening here. Yeah. It's awful. It was the way that we um, sort of soothed ourselves by thinking that we were so much on top of things, but honestly, the first word is reuse. Yeah. In, in the trine, it's reuse, recycle, no, reduce, reuse, recycle. Right. And um, I can kind of, I mean, I would feel a whole lot better if I thought the recycled stuff was going somewhere to be reused now, and I don't think it is, but I don't really hear people talking reduce too much. Hopefully a lot of people are. The problem is, how can you reduce when everything in the store is in plastic containers or of some sort or another? I mean, the, it's like the whole system is set up not to reduce. If yes. you want to yeah, it, this film actually, I think, was a good example of that, like the extremes that people had to go to to reduce. Mm -hmm. uh, they had to sort of step outside of society in order for that to uh -huh. work for them, you know? At least yeah. that's how I saw it. You almost can't buy anything that's not in plastic wrap or a container. It's the store, I mean, I was, I've been um, 
I have been taking long walks to the grocery stores lately because I'm having trouble with my knees. And so I walk best with a cart on the totally flat surface. So I've been exercising at grocery stores. And so I'm really looking, really looking. And, and it's actually, it's appalling. It's appalling. The packaging. Oh, my God. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, and anyone else here want to... Well, I like buying things in bulk so that there isn't a lot of packaging to dispose of, but I can't, but living, living alone, you can't buy things in bulk. I mean, I've got some stuff that I've had for years because I've only, I only eat it slowly. But anyway, it's just, it's, but this is a consumer society, that's for sure. And uh, I think it's not getting any better, but a lot of people have come to their senses and well, no, but it's when you get older and you say, what have I, and how am I going to get rid of all this stuff? My kids don't want it, blah, 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 blah. And it's, but it's too late by then, when you, once you get to this <laughs> point. I've been trying to, trying to, uh, what do you call it? Uh, down. Um, downsize. Downsize, downsize for years. But <laughs> my house is still full of stuff. Right. That's and I can't right. even go to Goodwill at the moment. I can't because I'm not driving. You can't do that with access. So I've got bags of stuff to go to Goodwill whenever I'm going to be able to go again. But oh dear, yeah, it's, it's really a problem. All right. Hey, but. hey Louise, shall we see if anyone else has uh, comments? That's one thing that was really obvious in this film is all these people strive for their niche in life, for lack of a better word community they couldn't do it alone they had to do it with community uh -huh. i think it's real important that we get to know our neighbors yeah i've been uh, going for walks every afternoon and there's a lady three blocks over that or has a beehive in front of her house uh, there used to be two then one now it's down to zero and she's got 25 gallons of honey to sell so i got some for me and the three other gardeners that i know all live about a block from me and so they got a quart jar of honey at my expense, and one of them fed me uh, two Thanksgiving dinners, and the other gave me uh, two pumpkin squashes. And now if I have extra radish seeds, which I'll probably have, I can give them to my neighbors. And I think we just need to start the community with where we're at. Oh, yeah. yes. Very good. Yes, indeed. That actually, that actually leads to my next quote, Al. Perfect. <laughs> So the next one, unless, is there anyone else who wants to talk about the comfort and consumerism of the first quote? Everyone's all muted. Oh, hey. Hi, Pam. Hello. Did you have a thought about? Well, I just thought I would pop in instead show of yourself. behind my name. Only, right? I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. we, we appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I think it, I wanted to follow, I guess, on Al's comment about community. I mean, the two that were the most profound for me was the woman who had the restaurant, the biker, tough woman, yeah. you know, that talked about living bottom, you know, and had a crowd of what she called family. And, you know, there was really a lovely codependence there you know I mean back to Kay Louise's comment they were looking out for not for one another and then the other was the the extended kind of wild gay community um, but the closing yeah. image was one of looking out at the sea and I think that there there's a truth to both which is is that I don't live alone Every, you know I do practically live alone but I <laughs> cannot live on, on by my, I mean, everything around me, whether it be this notebook or whether it be this sweater, came from someone. Someone created this. You know? <laughs> yeah. So really, you know, recognizing that we are incredibly interdependent and in terms of our inner world, we have to go it alone. So it's really an interesting contrast, I thought, in the film. You know, and yeah, I, I loved that they were young and kind of exploring, you know, breaking, yeah. breaking the rules and just 
living, you know, and see where they could go. And yes, I think that the, the, I mean, the challenge too for me is how do I live outside of my comfort and what would that look like? Yeah. You know, I think there was some closing par- quote that was really good that way, which was, you know, what is it in, that you want to live and, and do it? Yeah. So I, I actually am recording this whole session and if sometimes Zoom won't let you record a movie, so I don't know if it'll come through, but if it does, then I will, well, I'm going to send you all the link anyway, but if hopefully you guys will get a link to this movie so you can go back and watch it again if it got recorded. So Jenny, I'm I'm interested in hearing your second quote from that. Second quote. Okay, ready? Yes. The American culture wars are no accident. One side is painted as heartless, godless snobs in the cities. The other side as crude, uneducated bigots in the country. They got us pointing fingers across their imaginary lines, squabbling and blaming one another. If we learned anything on this bicycle trip, it's that when you blow away all the politicized smoke, most of us want most of the same things. And the day urban progressives and rural working class become the allies we were meant to be is the day we win. Beautiful. Mm. Good. Good yeah. book. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was great. Good. It's not black and white. You can't yeah. say country people are slobs and you can't say city people slick as a snob, whatever. I mean, there's yeah. a mix of everything. Slobs and snobs. I consider myself a country girl, but I'm living in Seattle. So <laughs> Right. So, but it's um, yeah, it's it's a mix. That's, you can't generalize and call you know just group people together and say they're all this and they're all that. But anyway, just interesting to. But that's it. We all need to give and take and to. But the community bit is very important. That yeah. and we're finding that out more with this, uh, COVID isolation business lockdown etc. So. But I've, I've found that all the time with my pea patch, with my garden club, with my Daughters of the British Empire. I mean, a lot of groups I belong to, and I mean, we, I'm really missing them terribly, but at least you can talk to people on the phone, you can Zoom, you know, we have Zoom meetings and all that stuff. So I think it's great now with all this technology, what we can do, and I'm very thankful that we have it. Whereas I met a girl I know from Lake City Community Centre lunches, and she doesn't have a computer at home, so she can't join any of these groups. And that's very sad. And I'm just so thankful that I can, because I used to go to the library if I wanted, I didn't have a printer, so I'd go to the library if I wanted to do printing. Well, you can't go yeah. to the library now. So I mean, it's just, oh. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I think it was the the gay community, Idol Wild, Idol something, anyway. Um, that them pointing out how important it is for people to meet you to not you know silo you into this is crazy hippie gay people but then they were going to church i think they were the ones that were going to church or community center and juggling and you know putting on a show for the the community and talking about being a part of the community Mm -hmm. that's good yeah, were there other um, examples from this film that you all remember? So I, I have a question of my own. What would the ideal community be? Yeah. And I heard one thing that you could uh, acquire your food without worrying about all the plastic that's on it. That would be great. <laughs> that would be awesome other ideas, ideal community? Well, one of the things that they talked about several times was getting to know themselves through going on that journey. So Mm. being part of the community, but also, you know, having the adventure and knowing themselves. Yeah, seeing yourself reflected in other people. Um, Finding out what your comfort levels are and what you (laughs) are able to put up with. Mm-hmm. Oh, and they also showed their own uh, having to encounter their own conflicts. That one okay. place where they were under the bridge, and well, something about you know you reacted, and I would you were angry, and you know blah blah blah. It's like yep, 
there's a slice of being human, you know. <laughs> yeah. Ideal community. Well, at this age, ideal community would be one that uh, has a very uh, uh, strong place for elders who may be losing this particular facility or that particular facility, but are still strong in talents and tons of things to offer and know-how and wisdom. Um, it's uh, like lately I've lost use of well, not totally, but um, I, I'm hardly able to walk. I'm toddling around with a walker lately, and I feel, wow, you know, I don't have family that's going to take me in when I'm older and all this and that, and, uh, you know, and it's scary. So ideal community to me would be that um, you're accepted even at a lesser amount of ability to do the harder work or the bigger things. You did, they just, you just find the, the new niche for yourself. Um, and that you're very well accepted at your, whatever age you are. Yeah. I thought that was reflected too in the, um, the biker restaurant mm -hmm. owner who was saying, um, I have people here, if I need something, there's six tents out there and I can yell for someone. Um, uh -huh. You know, having, I think that's another ideal community thing is being able to to exchange skills and yeah. goods and knowledge and um, in a really easy way. Seems like having lots of beer was pretty important too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was. Yes, yeah. make them happy. There's a, thing called, there's a thing called buy nothing, right? Buy nothing. Yeah. Well, right? there's in a lot of communities, and um, and so there's all kinds of groups um, that you can uh, be a part of. And so I don't, I'm trying to think of this one. I was in uh, Cedar Park, um, next door. That's what it was. Next door, Cedar Park. And yeah. for some reason, I got kicked out of it. I don't know. They said I said something not unacceptable. And I'm thinking, I was just commenting on the animals that people were seeing. And we were trying to figure, and I was saying, send the, send the coyotes over to my pea patch because we've got a, a, too many rabbits that are chewing up all our plants. And, and so, I mean, that's the sort of thing. I don't know what I did to offend somebody or whatever, but anyway, I mean, so ah. I thought, oh, well, it was taking up too much time anyway, so I won't bother. But I mean, there are some good groups around that you can all, you know, exchange, you know, do things, trade things, or, you know, well, they, they sold things on this site too, you know, and they advertised and all that sort of stuff. But I don't know. I think there's a lot of next doors around in different communities. So, there are a lot of things available now if you want to get into that. Yeah, it's just a matter of finding them. Yes. Hmm. So one of the things that really um, somewhat amazed me, um, and maybe it's because there's this environment right now between the rural and the urban conflict, is how many of these small towns have really been wiped out. And I thought it was interesting, the comment about how the Walmarts and the larger big box stores came in and got rid of the mom and pops. Because I know it was about mm, six, eight months ago, I was reading an article about how a lot of the small towns, the big box stores have now moved out because there's not enough people for them. Huh. And they're starting, and these towns are like, we don't have a grocery store. We got to figure out how to do this. And so they're literally kind of going back to the mom and pops, but it's just, wow. I, it just blows me away that we have so much richness in this country in terms of natural resources and people and talent and drive. And we're literally basically saying, if you're not on the coast, there's just not a lot of value. And I, I don't believe that, but yeah. it, I don't really understand. I, I thought it was really fascinating how they kind of did bring a little bit of what is going on between the coasts economically and socially and culturally, because we're definitely in a divide. And I just feel there's so much going on in the Midwest and so much resource there that we are completely walking away from. So 
So it's interesting. There was so many topics in this movie. It was really a fascinating movie. Yeah, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Also, did they start off on the East Coast? Yes. Ah. In Louisiana. I came in, I, I got North into- North Carolina. Oh, North Carolina, right. They're from, they're from North Carolina. Yeah, well, that's East Coast, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. North Carolina. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's- so that's good. The right across two years. Wow. Two years, and they they just did it with a GoFundMe of like two thousand dollars. Great. The cost of the whole film was two thousand dollars. Oh, two thousand three hundred and seventy six, or whatever it was. Wow. Okay, but was there a cameraman? Because I have to admit, I was sitting there trying to figure out the logistics of this, and they got some great aerial shots. There was definitely a cameraman along on the trip. Yeah, I don't know if they had a drone. They might have I was had a drone. Say, now they use drones. Yes, yeah. the drones are pretty popular. Mm. Um, I think it was, it was, it was an airplane. <laughs> What's that, Al? I think they also asked some of the people they met to take pictures of them. That was their camera person. Yeah, they saw, uh -huh. saw that happening. Um, well, a woman they, at the restaurant. Where where was that? It was Texas. In the desert somewhere. Texas. Yeah, it was Texas. Yeah. Texas. 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 I remember her. An unusual name. What was it? Something Q-U-Ville? Something Truckville? Something. Truckville, yeah. A truck it was. Some other unusual spelling. Yeah. 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 These are real places. Yeah. So was there, is there a real place called Ghost Town? Apparently. I thought I saw that was one of on one yeah. of the signposts. Hmm, goodness. I see there's some. Well, it's kind of funny stuff. because we're all sitting in our kind of each in our own little rooms watching a film. And you know, as I say this, I kind of go, that's right. And those people are still living their lives in the town in which it was filmed. Yeah. <laughs> right? Say, hello, you're real people. These are not actors and actresses, right? Right. But it isn't what we're doing now the, the same thing as the the bonfire in, in essence, you know, people who don't know each other um, commuting around a campfire. Yeah. We're missing mm. we're miss, missing the smoke and the beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. The music, yeah. So much good music. Yeah. Uh, so I have one final quote for us um, from their Facebook page. They said, this week we'll be looking at our story through the lens of immigration from the Catholic French Canadian exiles who fled their home and became the Cajuns of South Louisiana to the romantic Mexican opportunity seekers crossing the Southwest border. The United States gets so much of its flair and wisdom from the world's wild and oppressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Good, good sound bites. Yeah. My, my dad was born in, in France. I, I once worked in a Boeing group uh, structural repair manual where 50% of the employees had at least one parent who was born outside the United States. Uh. Wow. Yeah, it was it. Was it the film or was it one of you who was talking about um, that people forget about the or all of us being original immigrants and um, you know trying to make a living a, in whatever way we could? Well, not not me personally, but our <laughs> our ancestors <laughs> coming to the U.S. and now people are well, I guess. People are always immigrants were often seen as outsiders for quite a while. Mm. Right? Mm. Yeah. So some of us also have parents or grandparents who lived through the depression. Yeah. You know, so that's another piece in terms of consumerism and comfort, you know. Boy. I mean, I know my mother said there were times when she had oatmeal for dinner. Sure. Yeah. Oh, well, that's one thing about being brought up in the country. I mean, 
you always had food because you grew food and you, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. So I just have always appreciated having a garden, a veggie garden or uh, anyway, so. My mother grew up in the depression. And so I inherited from her this uh, mindset of scarcity, which makes it very hard for me to throw anything away because <laughs> I think everything I could use that for something but it is yes. but then you know like with every the packaging on everything like I have so much packaging in my house because I think well I'll use that for leftovers to give to someone to take away but I have way too many leftovers containers <laughs> Yeah. Or maybe so, this scrap of something, it's got some color and shininess. Maybe I can make it into some art of some sort. So I've got boxes of that stuff. Strings that are too short to be saved, right? Yeah. That get saved. <laughs> well, you're younger, that's why. I used to do that, but now yeah. I'm 79, so I don't do that anymore. Right. I just, but I'm trying to get to Goodwill, so I'm with somewhere because I've got yeah. all these bags and boxes and stuff and it's just accumulating mm. right but what do you do with that stuff hey, hey, hey louise i i live on whidby island i can't help you but you, <laughs> but you put out a call for help amongst these people on the on the zoom call and say who lives near me that would be willing to drive my stuff to goodwill There's my, well my the thing is i've hesitated to ask for that because I mean, I believe you've just got to queue up for ages. You know, it's just, it's, they've only got one line now. When I go by there with access, I look and I, there used to be two rows, two car, lines of cars. Now there's only one. So I guess they don't have enough staff to man it. And so it just takes forever and a day. No, that's it. I, I, I just wouldn't, wouldn't think that. See, my son I comes to help me every Monday. He's here at the moment down doing laundry downstairs, but he, he doesn't drive. He comes on the bus after work. And so, you know, I don't have anybody to, anyway. well. <laughs> okay, Louise, I actually heard, at least in Ballard, there's someone who's make, made a business of um, socially distancing, picking up your stuff and driving it to Goodwill for $25. Wow. And they, yeah. will, they will take that hour that it takes to, sit in line for you yeah, I mean to pay anybody to do that I mean that to me is awful because I've got a car sitting well it's got a dead battery but anyway so see yes I know there are people there are people who don't want to sit in line though just like junk. you got junk you know they they will do people will do things for a, a price right mm. yes mm. I thought it was very enterprising yes it gets the stuff to goodwill, which is the end goal, so. My 4-H group is putting together a module on tying knots. And so if, if people have strings or rope, <laughs> uh, that comes in handy. Of course, that's just a fraction of what we all have. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll mail that. I'll mail you some string up to Linwood. <laughs> you know, it's kind of interesting, the idea of how can we because the thing is, we all go, oh, I don't want it. I'll give it to Goodwill. And that's kind of like the general dumping ground. But um, when you start looking at nonprofits, you, if you spend a little bit of more time, and it does take time, you know, you can start seeing things like second use or recreative in um, Greenwood. I mean, they take, they literally take empty pill boxes. They take, you know, half open glue bottles. And you know what? If you need some glue, it's like a quarter. So it's a great way to get stuff too. But you do have to look a little bit further than Goodwill. But sometimes you can find some really interesting and as you said, innovative people out there doing things to reuse things. So, okay, maybe you just gotta look a little bit deeper. I, I think it's there, but, but you might have to pay if you're not willing to do any of the work yourself, unfortunately. Well, I can't, that's it because I'm, I've got all these infirmities wrong with me. That's the thing. Anyway, even walking. So anyway, but anyway, I'm still working on it. I'm still 
bagging stuff up and whatever. So I'm hoping one day to be able to move it. I'm putting these uh, quotes in the chat for you guys in case anyone wants to cut and paste them, keep them. Yeah, I can't even do that. <laughs> and, well, I will, I will email it afterwards as well, along with the recording of our discussion. Hey, Jenny, I have a question. Yeah. Um, last month, I volunteered for a Sunday dinner um, out of a church. And um, a lot of groups that um, serve food to um, the homeless. And uh, it seems like a, uh, um, um, a standard kind of thing where you flip the thing over and stuff like that. But it's insufficient for um, putting any kind of liquid, um, even a wet pasta and stuff like that. Um, and I don't know if. Yeah, it all has to be compostable now. So that's hard. Yeah, but I don't know if there's another uh, grade of, of um, you know, packaging that is still recyclable, but what we have now, um, you leave it on a counter for a while and it just folds up, you know, and and you can't keep serving dry pasta all the time or it'll end up, you know, in the street because the people won't, you know, won't eat it because they yeah. want to have more than just that. So I guess my question is, I don't know if anybody knows about this packaging that is used for takeout. And that's essentially what it is that we give to transients and homeless people, but some of them can't even get 10 steps with it and, and it collapses, you know, and yeah, um, the problem so is a real is, issue. I think yeah. someone should take the lead on. Yeah, I think that something recyclable would work for us, but unfortunately, that doesn't work for uh, the population that are receiving them because they don't have anywhere, and or they won't take the um, containers to be recycled. So it really has to right. all be compostable, mm -hmm. and that compostable stuff just uh, it can it can hold up to cold liquid but it, the hot liquid is really the problem Pam did you have something oh to... well I was going to say PCC has done a great job at investigating product packaging that's compostable and I know they went to a cornstarch you know rigid plastic kind of stuff that feels like plastic yeah. but I don't know that it would hold up to heat yeah I think yeah, you're exactly. Right. Well, you just have to cool things off first before you put them in the yard waste bin. No, we're talking about before handing them to someone to, so that they can eat it. Right? Oh, to carry with them. Yes, to carry with them, exactly. Well, they don't have want to be handing out cold food in the middle of winter. <laughs> well, I mean, I yeah, get no my box lunches from Lake City Community Center, which is HIP, Hunger Intervention Program. And they come in these box, uh, cardboardy sort of boxes. Yeah. They have soup, you know, hot soup in these other sort of little whatever bowls they are. And I mean, I used to put them in the yard waste. Now I put them in my fireplace and burn them. Hmm. So yeah. I don't have any problem getting rid of stuff like that. Great. Mm. So I'm going to say goodbye, folks. It's been really yeah. lovely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the film and the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. same here. Thank you. Any, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm out of quotes for you all. So, <laughs> unless anyone has any more um, thoughts that they'd like to share with the group, I think we can call it an evening and. Uh, and stop break my back is hurting too <laughs> from leaning forward so <laughs> well have a good week everybody and thank you so much for hosting this yeah yes. appreciate thank, it. You. thank, thank you. you everybody yeah i think that was a great conversation and i appreciate you all staying around for it mm -hmm. very good thanks also to you all very good thank you take care
Okay. Stay safe. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Yes, indeed. Take care. All right.